Hey guys, I'm here with Jacob Dancy. Did I say say your name right? Yeah, you got it. Dancy. Really? Yeah. Dancy. You're there. Dancy. I don't know. <laughs> I, I always struggle with or I, I don't know if I struggle that much, but I don't ever want to pronounce people's names wrong. And so I'm sit there and think, oh man, is that right? Yeah. You're but, good. No worries. Oh. Um here with Jacob Danzi. I've met him through the Lions Den. I'm sure everybody's sick of hearing that I've met someone through the Lions Den. <laughs> um seems like every single guest i've had on here is from the den but uh take advantage of it man oh yeah you know that's uh, the coaching group thing is, is huge and it's helped me a ton and i know we've talked about how it's helped you before too yeah so this we'll start off with um you know who are you what do you do yeah man well um we kind of already covered it man <laughs> jake big danzy i um um, I actually am a leadership and team development coach right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm doing that full time. I actually host uh, live public speaking events um, where we actually put leaders on stage and you know, they get to step into that role and uh, gain some more experience that way in front of the teams. Um, I also currently work in the uh, property restoration industry, so mm-hmm. blood, fire, mold, that type of stuff. Um, my background is all in automotive for the most part. So I did heavy duty over the road diesel. Um, I did Dodge Chrysler Jeep for a while. Um, you know, kind of all across the board sales, running the shops, everything. So, wow. I didn't know the heavy duty diesel. Yeah. I haven't had anybody on the podcast. That's kind of along that line of trade work. Sure. Um, yeah, it seems to be a lot of construction, Yeah, which, which I mean, that's home restoration as well, but, um, yeah, it's yeah, been a lot of construction almost specifically. So right on. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, man. There's a, I mean, I think there's a lot of avenues, right. In in blue collar stuff, I think a lot of people initially kind of think like construction stuff right off the bat, but there's also a lot of these guys that are doing, you know, like vehicles, for example, you know, especially, you know, diesels are talking to these guys that are working on, you know, uh, road equipment or, you know, any of that type of stuff for, for construction, these guys kind of on the back end, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, even within blue collar, it's just a totally different world, right? It's just totally different experiences from what you what you get yeah. being outside all day. Yeah, no, it's there's so many jobs, and a lot of them are overlooked because um, there's a huge push towards going to school. Yeah. And I mean, you can go to school for just about any of these jobs as well. But um, I think a difference, a huge difference here, is you can start out working, you don't have to go to school, and just work your way through. Which yeah. is a huge benefit because you don't have to get all of the, the student loans or you don't have to, you know, scrape your way to pay for school. You can learn something and be paid for it. Yeah, so. absolutely. And it's something that carries you forever because yeah. I feel like, I feel like blue collar work as a general, you know, don't take this for, for gospel, but I feel like blue collar work and the stuff that usually entails that mm-hmm. follows behind the advancement of technology a lot slower than a lot of other things. I mean, for the most part, we're still doing road construction and you know transportation pretty similar to what we were doing 30, 40, even 80 years ago, you know, that's really similar. Some stuff changes, but it's just, in my opinion, it's not making these like extreme leaps and bounds as a whole, mm-hmm. like technology in general. So it's something that as a trade will follow you. For, I mean, pretty much your whole life, like you're saying yeah. you, anything with it. Yeah. I mean, like you say, there's there so there's technology technological advances that do happen, um, and there are changes. But that's what I always am saying is like you see these tech layoffs and and everybody's all worried about AI and oh AI is going to take your job, which a lot of people for jobs are going to get taken by AI and sure. it's just the way it is. Because a lot of people are doing low value, um, easily replaceable work, but that's almost no trade jobs. Yeah. Um, and you know, a huge reason why I started the podcast is I noticed there was a lot of that going on. Um, but there's always people hiring in mm-hmm. any sort of, and I talk about construction because that's my world been always people hiring in construction, always somewhere, somebody will hire you. And then you have people laying, laying off in, um, computer science and engineering and, um, and all of that other stuff, which there is still a high demand for those too. And so it's kind of, kind of interesting 
you know? Yeah. It's a weird world. What, uh, let me ask you, what's your, what's your opinion on, on why just blue collar sector as a whole is struggling to find workers? I mean, my experience across the board has been just like you're saying, I've never had enough guys. The guys that I have found have been qualified or, you know, under motivated. And it's just, it's the total opposite of what we've always been told is like when I, you know, when I was growing up and when I was in school, you got to go to school, you got to you know, get a good education to get a great job. Mm. And now I look at all these blue collar jobs and I'm starting to see these numbers that, you know, they're just, people are offering ridiculous things to come and work for them and do these jobs because they're so understaffed. So yeah. what's, what's your opinion on why as a whole, it's so short? Yeah. Well, and I probably don't talk about this enough. Um, I, I think because there's been so much of a push towards just going and getting an education in general, um, th- you see like all these memes about people, um, holding up wads of cash saying like, you know, my teacher told me I was too dumb to go to college and then yeah. like showing the big stack <laughs> of money. And it's like, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of true. Like you'll hear that. I've hear I've heard that quite a few times. Like people literally will say, well, you probably should just work in construction. You should just work in construction. Or you say you're in construction. They're like, man, that's hard work. Why don't you try to go to school and get an education and do something else? And it's like the way we position our thoughts around these jobs. And like, I've heard that my whole life. You know, I, I was going to school to be an electrical engineer. And that's pretty much what I had decided since I was in about ninth grade. Um, going through engineering programs in um, high school, even starting in, in junior high, high school, going through college. I was thinking that, um, thinking I might be going into web development or software development. And so I even went down that route and it's just all of those other jobs are not as they're cracked up to be. Sure. And we have all these people filling up the colleges going for useless degrees. And, and like, I can't say engineering and software development and all that is not use useless degrees. Cause those are very yeah. useful and um, they are high paying and, and depends depending on what you go to school for, they're high paying, but there's so much of a push towards those that they're becoming all of these careers that you go to school for are becoming so over um, inflated with people that it, that, the competition's much more fierce and basically like people think that they're too good to go work in a, in a trade job yeah because it's, it's hard and they don't want to yeah. do it and i i don't know it's a, it's a it is it's a weird thing there because i know a lot of people look down on them and i've i've talked about this on social media before and people have been like well i'm sorry that you've experienced that but i don't know yeah you know i don't know anybody that's been like that and i'm like are you not open your eyes? You know, like sure. that's just how, like, it's the way we talk about these jobs in general that in the back of our minds, it's like, oh man, well, all I do is I just use my body instead of my brain and yeah. not realizing that it, it takes, it takes a lot of quite a bit of smarts to actually work in one of these jobs Yeah, and be successful. Oh yeah. So yeah. I mean, I would say that since, because of the way we talk about them, people think that they're just not worthy, worthy of their time. Sure. Yeah. Do you think that's a uniquely American thing? I I do. Yeah. So I went to Japan a couple of years ago and I guess it's probably been four now. Um, Taxi drivers over there are like top, top of top dollar jobs. Sure. Bus drivers, super coveted. If you're, if you're a taxi driver or a bus driver, you're like one of the most respected people around. And over here, that yeah. no, that right. that isn't the, that isn't how it is. And just about any job over there is like, you. I mean, they're they're all about working, and and um, they're not really a Christian society necessarily, so they don't really have that concept of um Saturday Sunday sure Sabbath type deal. So a lot of people just work like yeah. all the time, like every right. single day. Like they have random times off, you know. But that that's all they do is work. And so anytime you're working and doing something, it's respected over there. And in other places, like, I mean, I, I don't know much about European standards as far as that goes, but I think over here, people people want to do something better mm-hmm. 
than construction yeah. or you know working on cars or i mean whatever else you can think of that, yeah. that might be a trade job yeah it's interesting they say that because like i've never been to japan i don't know a ton about japanese culture but yeah. what i do know is like and correct me if i'm wrong like they're they're pretty much on par with the united states as far as technological advancements yeah. and like you know where they're at as a society so you can't really sit here and say like well it's because they're behind or it's because you know they're yeah. more third world no like they're they're basically on par yeah. with us oh no they yeah. they they're very um technological technologically focused um they have a lot more i, I think i'd even say they're even more so than In we are ways. oh yeah for sure yeah so they're very advanced and i just think it's the the mindset about it working as a people like Nobody wants to work here yeah. and they want the easiest job they can find uh, work from home. Like, like every single benefit you can possibly think of, like not work for three months out of the year from the start. I mean, like you get these people with these crazy ideas in their heads and it's like, that's not how it works. It's not how the world works. Yeah. I mean, that's not how our country is run right now. Um, that, and, and it's probably part of that, you know, people wanting, <sighs> Yeah. The handouts. So yeah. It's yeah. I agree. <laughs> I agree. I mean, we we could like yeah. we could like yeah. put the tinfoil hats on and yeah. go down the you know, go down the rabbit hole. Oh. But like, you know, there's that whole whole debate on communism versus capitalism and you know, all the, all that crap. And I, I mean I agree. I think at the end of the day, my personal opinion is we have created multiple, not just one, weird stigmas around blue collar work or working with your hands. And I think there's a couple reasons for that. And and the first like main ones really are like, when we talk about providing a product, especially in the United States, you know, number one, we have really taken on convenience over quality, right? And purely number, like truly because we import so much crap from China, so much stuff. And it's, it's cheaper for us legitimately. So when you start messing with like, dude, I got to like stop screwing with them. Cause I'm like not used to these. It's like, oh, that's well, like crap. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> um, if I don't touch it, it'll be okay. It'll just, <laughs> I'll just pretend. I think, there. I think the important thing is you just talk, try to keep it. I know. I'm, to just, it. <laughs> I'm so awful at it. Um, but they made things so much cheaper, yeah. you know? And I think that, I think that coupled into you know, how we moved away from like gold standard stuff with our dollar, those types of things, whatever. But it also came down to this, you know, supply and demand thing that the United States really kind of led the rest of the world in that we just, such a consumer society. We don't really try and fix things now. It's it's often cheaper or easier to to replace something. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a huge part of it. Um, you know, I think a second part of it, kind of like you, you, you touched on it earlier, that there's just some stuff that people think that they are too good for, right? And I think that comes down from, I don't know. I think it part of truly comes down from like our parents, you know, saying, Hey, you know, I don't want you to have to do what I did kind of a thing. They want a better life for us. Grandparents, same kind of a thing. And I think that on the other hand of that, I think that we, as, as a country have moved so far, so far forward into this comfort zone that we almost don't want to do things that are uncomfortable for us. And so we try to take these cushier things like you're saying, whereas something really interesting with us is we've got such a, such a history, such a strong holding of like, you know, the United States is the best place to live that we've got people walking thousands of miles now, literally walking to try and even get into our country, which, you know, staying away from the politics side of things, like you legitimately have people who, who just want to work Mm -hmm. and they're okay using their hands. Um, there's a, there's a really interesting book. It's one of my favorite books. Um, I've been using it for a long time, just in my leadership stuff, even when I, you know, before I was doing any sort of leadership coaching, um, and it's called, uh, frick now I can't even like, it's the best book ever. It's my favorite book. I can't remember the freaking name of it. <laughs> um, oh my gosh. I'm going to think of it here in just like two <laughs> seconds. Um, do you know what the Maculadora program was in Mexico? I think so. So nowadays we have. I don't, I'm going to slaughter it, Uzdma or whatever the agreement is, the trade agreement between mm-hmm. Canada, United States, and Mexico right now, mm-hmm. right? That's the current agreement. Um, I think Trump, I think it went into Trump in during Trump's era. Um, that's the current agreement between the three countries that we're going to prioritize trading with each other, you know, over those specific things. Um, 
in order for us to all kind of financially benefit, you know, there's tax implications and things back and forth on that. Before that, um, we had NAFTA. So it was the North American Free Trade Agreement. Similar concept, uh, Uzma or whatever it is now was basically just a kind of rehashed out deal. Mm -hmm. It was renegotiated essentially. Okay. Um, NAFTA went into effect. I want to say late eighties, but I think I'm pretty sure it was early nineties, probably around, um, you know, when I was born. So early nineties in that ballpark went into effect. And what came out of that uh, was Mexico developed the Maculadora program. And what that is, is essentially it was a program that as part of this trade agreement, they were trying to make it worthwhile and beneficial for American companies to cross over the border into Mexico and to build manufacturing facilities on the border. Okay. Cause they wanted the taxes, they wanted the money, they wanted the jobs, all of those things. And then controversially, it was easy to hop things back across the border. It was cheaper for us to get, you know, some of that labor and, and sell these products, um, worked really well for a long time. Um, but this book covers that it covers the entirety of what the North American free trade agreement was and basically how these interactions took place between Mexican leaders and managers and American Mexican or American leaders and managers. It's interesting because uh, the gal that wrote the book, she actually, um, she got all sorts of letters, collected letters, emails, all sorts of things um, from all sorts of different managers and leaders, Mexican companies, American companies, vice versa, all the way around the board interactions with employees and things like that. And she puts some of these real examples in this book and she actually dives into how those interactions are totally different, even though it's the exact same story, exact same situation, but people take it so differently purely based on the culture that they're in. Right. And it's funny because a lot of people are like, Oh, it's outdated. And I swear I read this thing every couple of months and I'm like, no, like hundred percent still applies mm-hmm. today because a lot of the stuff in there is just, you know, us as Americans, we expect things to be done now. We expect things to be done a certain way, but we also kind of want to sit and and revel in the glory. We want to kind of be in the cush part of it. But then the Mexicans, you know, it's basically, there's a lot of respect. There's a lot of, you know, dignity involved in, in doing these jobs and in performing these jobs. And if you disrespect them, you're going to lose, you know, all of their trust, all of their faith. And all of a sudden, like, they're just not going to do what you want, but they're going to outwork you until that point. And so it's just crazy to me to kind of read some of those things and see that. And then think about, we're just vacating jobs because we want to be lazy or comfortable or whatever. And then you got all these people who by no means a bad thing at all, they're willing to freaking do it. And they're, Mm. you know, I know a couple of guys, a couple of guys that I know that are working up at the, uh, at the mine right now, good friends of mine, man, they're freaking yeah. raking it yeah doing so good for themselves and their families so interesting conversation yeah well i mean even you look at a lot of the workforce in in construction around here like residential construction mm-hmm. a lot of the uh, mexican workers they, they're showing up you know about the t- same time we are um concrete guys are usually the first people on the job about six o'clock and they're staying there long past we're there. And a lot of times I'll end up going back to a job site um, at like five or six o'clock or even seven o'clock sometimes to, to do a couple things. And they're still there working. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they'll do that. And they'll do that, you know, seven days a week. And um, well, probably six days a week, you know, Sunday, yeah. Sunday, probably not. But um, they're, they're just willing to work. And you don't see that type of dedication from um Americans sure. and and I I hate to say that but it's true and you the people that do that climb the ranks pretty quickly and end up running their own businesses and end up um doing really well for themselves because they put in that work yeah and I think people just want to it, it's like yeah like this concept of not using your body and using your brain work smarter, not harder, like all of these things that have been taught over the years, that's like, oh, well, somehow working with your body is bad. Sure. Somehow doing physical labor is bad. But I mean, I, I'd argue why not work smarter and harder, you know? That, yeah. That's always been something that bugged me. And I think I saw a poster um, back in high school. It was Mike Rowe commenting on that work smarter, not harder. Um, and I don't remember if that's what he said in response was work smarter and harder, but that's always what I saw. And I'd be like, man, 
Like what a what a terrible thing to say. Yeah. And people will t- and I'll talk to people about it. Be like they'll be like, oh no, that's that's not what they're talking about. I'm like, eh, kinda. I mean, that's the implication. It's like sure. Work, you work hard, and it's like, oh well, you're not doing what you should be doing, which is working smarter and using your brain. Yeah. Sometimes there's a combination there of both, and that's and that's pushing people away from the idea that working hard with your body is a good thing and turning it into a bad thing that you know yeah so oh, yeah it, it's a it's that weird these these shifts in our mindsets over the years that are just slow you know exactly it, slow brought on by the school system usually um it's just it's just not it's just not productive for society yeah because there will always be these jobs that people need to do that are going to be paying really well, especially in the coming years when nobody wants to do them. Exactly. <laughs> and exactly. Always going to be paying pretty dang good and never going to be taken over by technology or AI or any of that crap. And yeah, we're, is it the new, I think it's the new Willy Wonka. Cause you got Charlie and chocolate factory is the old school run. Right. And then you got Willy Wonka and the chocolate yes, factory. Willy the one Wonka. with Johnny Depp. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like in that when, uh, you know, they find out the dad's going to lose his job because they got a machine that's going to put the put the yeah. caps on the toothpaste, right? Yeah, yeah. And at the end of the movie, it's like, okay, now he fixes the machine. Yeah. You know, it's just like you're saying. It. So really interesting concept. I found the book. I wanted to make sure you knew. It's called Management in Two Cultures. Um, if you don't have it and you work with a, you know, specifically Mexican workforce, uh, this is huge. It'll be it'll help you so much. Um, and I, I usually give them out to a bunch of guys I lead, but. That's that's one big problem. Touch on that real quick is like yeah. a lot of a lot of the Mexicans, and I'm not saying I mean we're really not the best at it either. Is like managing the two different cultures is yeah. is hard, and it it's is. it's hard to get the guys to um, stick around because they because they'll like you said feel like the, the, they don't have that respect. Yep, and then they'll just kind of disappear. Yep, when that's not really the case, but the it comes across that way to them. Yeah, and exactly. So. Exactly. It's yeah, it's it's so weird to I shouldn't say weird. It is exactly like anything else that you're comfortable with. When we get comfortable with something, it's really hard to get out of our tunnel vision and think about how somebody else might be doing it or thinking it. Yeah. Right. So when we think about that as like a workforce, stuff that you and me might talk about on a daily basis, like, you know, this is what we expect in the job. This is the type of, you know, results that we'd expect. And you turn it to somebody else, you know, especially from a different culture, a different country. And they're like, dude, that's, that's not freaking normal. Like that's, you know, way too much. That's not enough. That's, you know, disrespectful, whatever it is. Um, so it's interesting to see that, but yeah, um, you can pick them up on Amazon. They don't make them anymore. So you might get a used copy, but dude, it's totally worth it. Um, it's funny that you mentioned that because so there was a, um, there was a time when I was back doing uh, diesel. I was working for a pretty big um, company. It's a company that everybody knows. I, I don't know if I should say it, whatever. It was, I was working for Penske. Okay. So the easiest way to do it. Everybody knows them. They got big yellow trucks, right? So um, little known fact to people outside of the industry, Penske does um, a lot of contract lease work. So they don't just have the moving trucks. Okay. A lot of the semis sleepers and, uh, you know, day cabs that you see on the roads are actually Penske owned lease vehicles. So Costco has a lot of, uh, trucks, UPS, FedEx, uh, Smith's, uh, specifically here in Utah, we got like IHC, a lot of these companies. And, uh, what's really interesting about it is when I got into the industry and was, and was working in specifically on the service side, you know, this was about five, six years ago. Um, it was right in this weird time of like, you know, we've got all these old timers that have a ton of experience, right? Decades of experience. And when you talk about them, you're like, these are killer techs. They know exactly what they're doing. They can fix anything on these stuff. Then you got all these new guys that are trying to come in and get trained. And in some ways, you know, they don't, they don't know everything. They haven't been around it as much. And so you got these old guys kind of like almost beating them down a little bit, kind of like the typical, you know, stuff that happens in blue collar sometimes, or, you know, you give them, given their weapons and and you just tell them they're dumb until they figure it out kind of a thing. Right. But they, I got sent to a training class and in that training class, um, Penske had ran a company wide, um, whatever you want to call it research project, basically. And they also took this across the industry. 
but they mostly focused on specifically within their company. And what it was, was with all of this new technology coming on. So we've got electric trucks, we got self-driving trucks, all these random things. We've got this, we've got the capability now in some of these trucks to, while the truck is driving on the road, link to internet and actually be able to diagnose and fix some problems and push updates to these vehicles while they're driving. That's crazy. Yeah. It's insane. Right. So there's all this crazy crap going on. Well, they wanted to know, is it going to be more cost effective for us to take all these guys who already know how to work on these engines and work on these, you know, body styles and train them on the new technology? Or is it going to be more cost effective for me to take some 17 year old, put him through a development program and train him on all of the new crap that's coming out and then, you know, he'll learn on the old stuff as he, as he goes along. So they ran this research product project. Mm-hmm. You want to take a guess at how much more it was actually going to cost to retrain the old technicians compared to the new techs? A year or just in general? Like uh, overall, we'll just say overall percentage wise, right? Like two, three, four, five times as much, you know, maybe one and a half time, whatever that was. What do you think it was for, for them to train a new kid versus retrain an old guy? How much more was going to cost the old guy? Mm, probably double. It was two to three times. In some cases, triple wow. the cost to retrain, <laughs> retrain an someone. old technician Wow. to do new technology. Wow. Right. So that in and of itself was interesting because then I had techs working for me that were all from different cultures, young kids, they run in circles around some of these, these old timers Mm. and they've got years, you know, on the wrench compared to these kids, but they're making way more money. They're flagging way more hours. And what's interesting is like, they were also making way more mistakes because they're still trying to figure out some of this old stuff and learn this new stuff, but they're still coming out on top. So it's funny to me to see that and to see some of these guys, you know, we're working with hundred percent, you know, all respect to them, but like, they're kind of still trying to scrape by, you know, a lot of cases they are trying to get retirement, they're trying to do these things. And then I'm looking at some of these younger kids and I'm just like, holy crap, like, I'm not that old, but man, I was watching these 18, 19, 20 year olds, you know, within the last couple of years making six figures. And I mean, that blew my mind. If I was making six figures at 18, I don't know what I'd do with myself. <laughs> yeah. But Pretty crazy. Like I said, it was always it was always the immigrant families. It was always the kids that had come and like one busted their asses to be here. But yeah. then two, like they kind of carried that over. And it was weird because it's almost like, well, you can't say these old timers like don't want to work because they're working. It's I think it's that complacency. Sure. Um that you know, something that I've never wanted to fall into. And I see a lot of um, in general, just looking around where people are are content with where they're at. Um, I think in my situation, um, growing up, I was um, blessed to have a surrounding where it was never like, well, this is just good enough. We're just going to settle for this. And it was always, you know, work harder, do, you know, do more, get better, do all this stuff. Yeah. And I, I don't think a lot of people have that. And, and that, you know, like we've already said, it's, it, it, it comes down to culture here. And, and I don't know how that's fixed, you know, because I think that is partially how people are learning in school. I think yeah. that's partially parents not being very involved with their kids' development, um, shipping them off to school, not having, um, you know, they're not taking a lot of the teaching on themselves uh, to teach their kids how to, you know, just work, how to um, behave. I mean, you don't learn that stuff in school necessarily. Sure. Um, yeah, no, it's interesting to see. It's, it really is. Um, and I've always got that kind of feeling that a lot of people here are entitled and <laughs> also aren't taught that basic like how to work yeah as compared to other places yeah especially you know people in mexico because because i I think people here are so privileged um with everything that they have and even people that aren't very wealthy or very privileged in what they have and you go somewhere else and it's 
not really the same. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. even if it's still a country that's advanced, like it's just not the same as yeah. just being here. I cannot remember his name for the life of me, but um, Ryan Mickler did a did an interview in the Order Man podcast with a gentleman who um, I think he came from Syria, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. And as I start saying this, you might you might remember it if you've listened to him about as many as I have. But um, really smart guy. He's got he's got like a doctorate in I don't even know what it was. Like basically like um like human like human anthropology essentially right and like psychology and all this stuff but he actually he made a point where he just says yeah i i fully believe that it's it's due to the fact that that americans are so lazy and like you're saying they're so comfortable and everything's advanced so far in your guys society that you guys have to start creating problems for yourselves like you guys don't know what it's actually like to to have a hard life or to have to survive you know literally in some of these cases where people are you know seeking asylum and things like that and he's like i came from a freaking country it was like that and then i had to go to school and do all these things right and he's like man you, the problems you guys have as americans are like uniquely american you know and yeah. i'm not going to get into the list but i'm sure you can guess you know oh, what yeah. kind of things that we talk about in this day and age that you're kind of oh. like since when did that even become a problem in our oh, yeah. society right well, that's that's a thought that i've i've had quite a bit lately it's like you see people that are complaining about um and we'll, we'll not go into it Good, good. <laughs> like like self worth self worth self image like how we perceive ourselves all these problems all these problems that come with that it's like most people don't even get to think that exactly. in the first place most people don't even get to think that most people are so in in other places in the world are so focused on working and providing and doing all that stuff that they don't even yeah. What do you mean? Exactly. Like, what do you mean? Why, why is that even a problem? Yeah. It's wow. funny that you mentioned, um, you know, you kind of specifically use the word like prideful, like people are so prideful. Yeah. They're so, you know, full of themselves, whatever. And it's interesting because when we think about like, in my opinion, at least when you think about pride and ego, you know, it's not always a bad thing, either one of those things, yeah. but like yeah. there is definitely an aspect to pride and ego that we can all recognize and understand that like, None of us like to be wrong. None of us like to even more admit that we're wrong, right? And you couple that with the fact that you, know, you brought this up earlier. When you're in the United States, I'll be totally honest. I've lived in another country. I have literally built homes for people out of garbage, you know, digging holes with my bare hands, okay? If you live in the United States, you don't have it that bad, Yeah. period. Yeah. You know, and I, and I looked at these people when I was, you know, personally doing it with my own hands and they were happy they were good to go mm -hmm. their life was way more simple than ours was way more simple and yet i honestly felt like they had a lot you know they had a lot better experiences they had a lot better memories they had a lot better drive they had a lot better mm -hmm. you know i guess their their list of priorities was i don't know put together a whole hell of a lot better than ours are because like some days i just feel like there's a lot of people that i you know, that I see on the internet and TV and everything, especially TV. I don't, I don't watch a lot of TV. I haven't my whole life, but I, I, at a pretty young age recognized that like part of the reason why I didn't enjoy watching TV is because I'm like, dude, these celebrities don't have, they have, they have their heads so far up there, but they don't uh, know what's going on. Yeah, no, you know, either. they don't even know the real world. Yeah. And so I just don't really care. I, I don't care to know what's going on with anybody. And I couldn't yeah. tell you any of that stuff, but then I turn and look at some of these people who, man, they're make they're okay making a couple bucks a day in some mm -hmm. countries, you know, a couple bucks a week. And they're just happy. They're yeah. good to go. Right? right. So honestly, my opinion is, is exactly that. I think we as Americans have tied so much pride and ego, even into being American that you can live in a, in a pretty bad place, you know, in America. But dude, if you have drywall, like number one, if you have a roof that doesn't leak, if you have AC, if you have heat, if you have even a bed, man, if you have your own bed, anything, any of those things, like you're you're really not that bad. You're yeah. not that far off. Yeah. Because I know plenty of people that don't have any of it. Yeah. And they'll outwork you every single day. Yeah. Well, we we start to get down to this rabbit hole and how we're we're making problems for ourselves. Yeah. A lot of people because life is so comfy and cushy and there's really not that much to worry about. Oh, for sure. Um everybody like so even though there's not that much to worry about. 
depression through the roof, Mm -hmm. stress through the roof, anxiety through the roof. Because we as humans have like, and, and this is like, I don't have any scientific um, reasoning for all of this. Um, I, there, there is very biological reasons for for why this is the way it is, but I'm not gonna like go into that. Um, basically, like if you're in stressful situations all the time, and you're working through them and you're pushing yourself through them, you're going to be less stressed. Yeah. Oh yeah. If if you're doing that, like because there aren't actually so many times where we're actually worried for our life, worried for where we're going to get the next meal, where sure. all of that, we, we have to like make these problems in our head because exactly. And, and it's not even, we have to make these problems. It's like everything is this big stress, like end of the world. Like, because, because we're not, we don't have this resilience. Yeah. Like, and that's kind of my own thoughts and turned into like a, a, an explanation of it. And I'm sure there's like, better way to explain this but you you build up a a, a tolerance and a and a oh, and for resilience sure. for sure per, per se and like your ability to handle stress goes up in if you're exposed to it quite a bit yeah which is really like working in a physical labor job like and the, and this is where i'm starting to piece together it's just like working a, a muscle things like high stress high stress on your body yeah. Working out. Yeah. Working your body out and put putting your body through that physical stress helps you deal with mental stress and anxiety and depression and all that. Yeah. Um, manual labor job, all the physical, but also there's mental stress that goes along with that that you're always um um introduced to. Where I'm getting at with this is all of this stress you're being um introduced to somebody else would like crumble under because they they are not used to it at all and i think that is a huge benefit to working in a trade job because they are physical they are very demanding they're high stress coming out the other side you're going to be 20 times better than all and then a lot of other people working at an office sitting at a desk with air conditioning all of that stuff if you're in that scenario you literally have to make stressful situations for yourself yeah otherwise when things actually go wrong or like you start to get depressed or down on yourself which is normal everybody experiences that the thing that's different is when you have that resilience built up from you know i and i like working out physical labor you know being out in the elements out in the sun stressful situations all of when you build up all of that life is not like doesn't seem so hard yeah doesn't seem so hard and and you know i like i said i wish i had a better way to explain that like scientifically oh for sure but like building up that resilience well and and i think like you know we've all heard the whole like yeah you know fire tempers iron thing right and like you know steel sharpens steel and like you know there's truth that we're talking about physical nature we're talking about you know things that are be done being done by hand by man but like do those same things apply on a genetic level or even on an emotional level? So here's a couple, like a couple things for you that I, that I truly, I mean, I don't know, same thing. I don't, I don't have any evidence to back this up other than, you know, what I can tell you from observation, but like, let's talk about dogs, for example, dog breeds. Okay. There's, I don't even know how many freaking different dog breeds, right? As many as there is different cultures of humans on this planet, every single one of those dogs has a purpose. Mm-hmm. I grew up with rats. I can call them rats. I, I don't have one now, but I have a German shepherd. Thank you. But like <laughs> even the rats, you know, have, they they have, have a purpose. purpose, right? Everything was made for a reason. But yeah. what's interesting about that is humans bred out the traits that they didn't want yeah. to keep the ones they did, yeah. right? So you look at a, a small dog that we would consider lap dogs or anything like that. You go back into their history and you think, okay, this, you know, you think about some of these terrier breeds. Well, the terriers were, were bred to, to get rats. They were bred to chase rats in in England. Okay. So they had a purpose. You think about some of these, you know, what we would consider working dogs now today, right? Malinois, German shepherds, you know, things like that. Okay. What, what is their purpose? They, they still have very high drive, right? A lot of the cases, extremely high intelligence, loyalty They're you know, we consider all dogs to be loyal, but man, that stuff's pushed really high. 
So they've gone and selectively bred in or out certain traits to keep these things. Well, then we look at us as humans in a culture. Well, are we doing that to ourselves within individual countries as well, based on, mm. you know, the environments that we're living in? You know, you're talking about mental exhaustion, physical exhaustion. Really great example. And I've mentioned this to multiple people. Anybody that knows me knows that I, um, you know, I, I learned Spanish, like I said, when I was, I was living in Mexico and I, I love it. I do speak at a business level proficiency, but you know, we were talking about this when we started, if I spend the majority of my day speaking with certain people, um, close friends of mine that have a very, very high native, you know, speaking fluency of mm -hmm. Spanish versus speaking English on a day-to-day -day basis intermixed with, you know, Spanish that would typically just be some of my workers the level of emotion or of, of mental exhaustion okay. is so high that I legitimately start to like shut down at the end of the day. I mean, I almost can't work out. I almost can't do these things because now it starts pulling on the physical, you know, nature and the physical exhaustion of this. Mm -hmm. Controversially, when we start talking about like, okay, let's focus on so much education. Let's focus, you know, so much on working smarter, not harder, these mm -hmm. types of things, right? We're saving our we're saving our physical energy to like, you know, help out with our, with our emotional energy or our mental energy. But then what ends up happening to our bodies? The United States has such a massive obesity rate. So many people are even out of shape, even if you're not obese, like how many freaking health concerns do we have, you know, not withstanding talking about like diets or whatever, any of that crap, but just like you're trading one thing for another, right? It's all like all things in moderation. Yep. You know, I talk about my German shepherd, for example, love her to death. She's a, she's a young pup. She's still three and a half, four years yeah. old, but I know full well that German shepherds as much drive as they have, as loyal as she is, as amazing she is. I know full well, she's probably going to get cancer. I know full well, she's probably going to have hip dysplasia at some point, right? She made it out of her puppy years, but she, she's probably going to get it pretty early. She's probably not going to live past seven, eight years old kind of a thing, right? Where I look at the dogs that I had growing up, I had Shih Tzus, I had Yorkies. Shit, we had a Shih Tzu man, she was just still putting around and, you know, we made the choice to put her down because she kind of didn't do a whole lot. Yeah. She was 16 years old. Yeah. I, who the hell knows how long she would have lived, you know, but what else did she do? Yeah. She couldn't have stopped, you know, an intruder. She couldn't have done any of these other things. Yeah. So like we're talking about all of this and we're talking about, you know, the workforce and we're looking at what things people are willing to trade off or, or push off to the side in order to keep other things. And I, I would honestly argue that like here in the United States and our, in our specific like <laughs> industries of blue collar stuff, we have just prioritized convenience and comfort in these things so much that now we're, we're dealing with the, with the repercussions, so to speak on the back end, we focus so much on our, on our education or our, our mental health, right? That now we're dealing with the problems of the physical health. Mm -hmm. Right now we've got to try and fix these things. Now we've got well, to figure out what the problem is and then fix it. Well, that fun, the funny thing about that is focus, even though we're focusing so much on, on knowledge and using your brain and all that mental health problems yeah. going through the roof, exactly. physical health problems going through the roof because nobody's your physical health directly affects your, your, your mental health. hundred percent. And a lot of people are having sleep problems. A lot of people are getting, um, you know, health problems, like numerous health problems. You don't even need to go into them. because There's, yeah. there's, there's so there's, many different, you can't even name them. All. There's so, there's so many sure. different ones. And a lot of it comes from not getting enough physical activity and physical stress. I mean, the, the funny thing that I always hear is people will say, Oh man, you work in construction. Oh, well, that's hard. Like you're going to have a bad back. You're going to break your back, blah, blah, yeah. blah. It's going to beat your body up. Right. And you then you see people that sit in a desk all day. They have terrible backs. You carry backs 35 than, pounds oh, around and you're slouched over all day. They have worse Dying. backs than anybody I see yeah. in a construction job. And they're they're not healthy at all. Mm -mm. They're they're terrible shape, don't get good sleep. Most people in construction, they like are, you know, generally healthier. I mean, like, I mean, I wouldn't I don't know if I would say healthier because there's not a very good culture of keeping your body actually healthy and actually you know protecting your body against because you the, run on the same stuff as all the sales guys yeah, it's all energy it, drinks yeah. and freaking gas station nachos exactly <laughs> but like overall i i mean 
it's a lot harder to yeah. have a lot of those health problems. And it's it's really like, you know, getting up and getting after it, using your body. Like you got to use it or lose it. Yeah, it's and intentional you, decision. And comfort is dangerous. Yeah. It's very dangerous. Exactly. It's so nice to just sit back and and lay back on a couch. <laughs> it is so nice to not have to worry about anything ever, not have to use like use any brain power. Like, yeah. Always just be traveling around like on vacation. Like it's so nice to yeah. be able to do that. But like what's the cost? Exactly. To your mental health and sanity. And that's that's what's funny to me is a lot of people are talking about like mental health like oh people are working too much it's bad for your health people are working too much it's bad for your 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 body it's like but what well, what what have we been doing for the last however many years we've been a uh, humans have been around sure yeah like exactly humans are meant to move they're meant to use their bodies they're meant to build things yeah like that's what we do right not meant to just sit back at a desk and and watch TV and 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 work even work on a computer. I mean that's just not how we're meant to be. Yeah. And like we're meant to have a purpose. Yeah. And that leads me to kind of what I was noticing when when you were talking is like like dogs bred for a purpose. Yeah. Those same dogs if if you don't use them for their intended purpose or they don't have a job, they go crazy. Yeah. They don't live as long. Um, they tear things up. People complain because they don't have a good dog because they don't give it a purpose. They aren't leading it. They aren't letting it know what it needs to do. People are the same way. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I, uh, when I was going to school, you know, when I was doing the whole college thing, yeah. uh, <laughs> hey, I, did um, too. <laughs> I got super, I got super, super interested in human anthropology. Yeah. Okay. I have raging ADHD. Okay. Yeah. I'll just, I'll, I'll own it and I'll admit yeah. it. And this, yeah. this is a really interesting topic because a couple of things in this ADHD, somebody, I remember a year or two ago, somebody had mentioned this to me and they said, you know, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, right? Disorder. We're talking about the potential for something to be wrong with you. Like yep. you're missing a part or, you know, some yep. programming is corrupt or something, right? They said, what if as humans, we actually were built in with that feature and it was a survival instinct? What if mm -hmm. the ability to sit at a desk and stare at a computer for eight hours a freaking it's, day and do the same not thing normal. is not normal because <laughs> we were trying to survive, because yeah. we were trying to constantly be on the lookout for the next thing, yep. because we were trying to gather food, we were trying to mm -hmm. find stuff that's interesting, we're trying to develop ourselves, build things, any of this stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. So there's two really interesting studies. I can't cite where they're at, I can't even cite, remember who did them, but I'm going to remember them. I'm going to try and, and tell you as much as I can without making them, without butchering them, but if you look hard enough, you can find them. They're pretty, they're pretty well known. First one is um, on some studies of uh, Native Americans and, and um, I, I believe it was Inuits. I'm not trying to be politically incorrect or anything there, but like Native Americans specifically lived in, you know, the Pacific North. So Alaska, Canada type of thing. It's a really interesting study on their diet. Um, we're talking pretty much all animal products, right? You really can't get a whole lot of vegetables, nothing really grow up there type of a thing. So you're talking fish, you're talking, you know, mammals that you could hunt, those types of stuff. Uh, really interesting study that they found that all of these people had been eating this diet for hundreds, thousands of years, potentially. And they actually had some of the lowest like cholesterol scores, lowest cancer rates, all of these health problems they didn't have, which they weren't eating vegetables. They weren't eating processed Jack. You know, they're eating all the stuff that we're told is going to raise your cholesterol. It's going to be bad for you. All this awful stuff, right? Really interesting. Second one actually specifically deals with, um, uh, Mexicans versus uh, Americans. Mm -hmm. And they actually talk about this region and they, and they, there's a study and it actually even has like a, a really funny name because what's interesting about it is uh, Mexicans almost have a double lifespan compared to the United States compared to Americans. And the research that was done there was very, very similar diets, very similar, you know, types of, of programs of eating and things like that. But however, it was based on uh, genetics, number one, what the people were used to, what they were exposed to, and what was in their food necessarily. And, you know, it was weird because they have things like obesity rates, almost the same, um, you know, when this study was done. Cholesterol rates, almost the same. You know, all of these things were very, very similar. However, 
Mexicans on average, we're living like 35 years, 37 years longer than Americans. Mm. Why? Oh. There's no, there's no empirical evidence that you can look at because according to the evidence it shows that everybody was just as unhealthy or as healthy as the next guy, but they're living for literally another half a lifetime and, you know, span more than us. So what is it? Is it the stuff that's in our food? Is it how we're eating these types of things? Are we breeding things out of ourselves? Are we breeding things in? So just thinking about like, about that type of concept and how humans miraculously have lived for however the hell long, right? Yeah. Like you can tell me life expectancy went up, you know, from 30 years to 80 years, but that just might be because you were less likely to get smallpox or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. I think some things are great nowadays, but don't tell me it's because I'm eating too much red meat. Don't yeah. tell me it's because, you know, and controversially at the same time, don't tell me it's because, you know, you're eating a hunter gatherer diet. There's all this evidence that shows all that, but is it just purely because we're not moving enough yeah. is it purely because we're, we think we're smarter than we really are. And so now we've created genetically modified food in order to s satisfy the food shortage issue. But now we've, traded off quality. So it's just kind of an interesting discussion of like, what, what truly are we genetically working out of ourselves to take comfort, to make our lives easier in the name of technological advancement, you know, mental advancement and all these types of things. And at the same time, still not pulling it off because I mean, you brought up a great point. We're focusing so much on mental health. We're focusing so much on being so smart why do we have such high oh. mental health rates? Oh, why do we have such high suicide high. rates? Why why can't we come up with solutions for half yeah. this crap yeah. if we're that smart? Yeah. So are we really as smart as we think we are? Or at this point, are we just like, I don't know, trying to reinvent the wheel? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Pretty, well, like there's a lot of there's a lot of to unpack there. Yeah. <laughs> there is. There's, there's a lot. <laughs> so I yeah. It's, it's an interesting conversation to think about why all of a sudden in the last 30, 40 years, we have decided that all of these things like working hard, building stuff with your hands, which was a pretty freaking noble and valued yeah. skill yeah. For, for all of history, for all of, all of mankind now. <laughs> is now suddenly a yeah. low end trade. Now yeah. suddenly for somebody who... You know, like we've kind of been told, you either can't sit still long yes. enough to do something yeah. or because you're not smart enough to do it. Yeah, exactly. And not smart enough. That's, you know? Let's talk about that. Not you, not smart yeah. enough. To go, not smart that. enough. I mean, I, I've always heard, and I don't want to be, I don't want to sound, you know, pretentious or like I'm better than people, but like I always heard people telling me like, oh, you're too smart to do that. You'd go use your brain, and I'm like, well, "What? Yeah, what does it? What does that even mean? What What does that even mean? Do you think you don't use your brain working in a trade? <laughs> Honestly, man, when I when I came up through diesel and in the automotive world, I spent a lot more time thinking about that, yeah. and I'm like, dude. I mean, I'm, I'm probably more like, I know I'm not probably, I am. I am more likely to die because somebody screwed up the repair on my freaking brakes than I am, you know, I'm going to die from some medical malpractice yeah. thing because I'm probably not ever even going to be on the table for that type of surgery, Yeah, which is relatively yeah. statistically speaking. So yeah. you want to tell me that, you know, mechanics are dumb. Yeah, you want to exactly. tell me that these guys <laughs> working on building building on building roads, building bridges, doing yeah. any of this crap. You want to tell me that they're dumb? Sit, sit from your, you know, five-story building up at the top. And exactly. Put together by, you know, some people that are too smart. Right. I mean, I mean too, dumb, too dumb. Too dumb, too dumb, to, go to, exactly. too dumb to go to school. You know? No, it's it's ridiculous. Um, yeah, a lot to unpack there. I mean, I on one hand, it's like, how can, how have we gotten here? How have we gotten to the point where, being physical is somehow bad being you know working with your body using your body even though that's what we've always done um like like that comfort the idea of comfort is dangerous um and i keep saying that because that's something that i'm always thinking about whenever you start to get too comfortable it it's almost time to start changing some stuff yeah, because you start to get too comfortable, you start to get stagnant, 
start to not grow right as a per as a person um one thing i've noticed working in in construction and in concrete is you're almost never comfortable sure working doing a trade job yeah that does a ton for your your mental and physical health there aren't a whole lot of people working in construction jobs that are that are focused and and active that are worrying about that type of stuff mm-hmm. um not a, i mean i don't know if you could go look at statistics looking at people that are working with their hands and and um have that purpose and look at their mental health problem you know percentage as compared to you know some other people that are kind of um scholars going to school like only you know sitting in their mind and thinking about stuff and 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 like thinking so much that it turns into you know manufacturing problems and Mm -hmm. and doing all that i don't know if you could look but i would almost wager that people working in in these types of jobs have less mental health problems overall i mean there is there is that added stress from being in in them because almost no matter where you go there's there's that stress but that's how it is in every job sure you know in a lot of tech jobs especially right now i mean yeah people that are stressed out whether or not they're gonna even have a job yeah oh yeah and and that worry stops a lot of these people in their tracks because nothing else is very hard in their life sure so you know, it, 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 there's a lot of different directions you can go there. Um, I, I always am telling people to be uncomfortable, and and that's something that we hear a lot, and that's probably the the single most important thing I've ever heard. Yeah, is be uncomfortable. Yeah, you know, I take cold showers in the morning now. Yeah, not to try to feel like I'm badass. I don't even I don't even know if I've posted about it. Like. You know, you see people taking pictures of their watches. Like Jocko got famous from taking a picture of his watch when he wakes up at four thirty or whatever. I've been waking up at four thirty as well. Yeah, it's uncomfortable for me. I I like it once I'm awake. It's uncomfortable. It's hard to get out of bed. Sure. Cold showers afterwards, awesome. Hard to do it. Hard to do it. (laughs) Exactly. But the amount of um, the amount that's helped me insane yeah in managing a busy schedule uh, in managing all the stress um it, it has helped me out so much that i can't even describe sure. and and you got all these these people that are trying to do less do less um do easier um you know work less all of that type of stuff yeah and i and you know this leads us back to where we started is like you know, how did this come about? Work smarter, not harder, all that stuff. Yeah. I, I think it, you know, now that we've come full circle, it is it is totally people wanting to do less and getting so comfortable. Yeah. And I think one of the awesome benefits to working in a trade job is always being uncomfortable. Yeah. And which is why it's hard and why so many people here don't want to. Because everybody wants that comfort and sees that comfort and it's so easily accessible that that's uncomfortable. I don't want to do it. Yep. Exactly. But, you know, as humans, when we're uncomfortable, that's where that that, that, uh, stress starts to kind of build up. And that's how we grow. That's how we, that's how we get better. That's how we can push through. And when the next thing happens that, you know, the next bad thing happens in your life, you can calmly step back and be like, okay, well, what do I need to do to fix this? Or, you know, whatever, instead of being like, Oh, well, I'm actually a girl instead of a boy. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't want to get into that. Yeah, too that's... Much, but like, you know, instead of like making up these problems, like I'm, I'm actually a girl. Yeah. Like, like what the heck? I just, so. One, of my, one of my mentors said this to me and it's super simple and it really hit home, but it's truly rep- repetition builds reputation. Yeah. Honestly. I mean, you and I both do jujitsu. We both roll. Oh yeah. Dude. I've seen plenty of talented white belts. I've seen plenty of talented blue belts, but for anybody that does jujitsu, I mean, we know that half of moving up isn't how good you actually are at jujitsu. Mm-hmm. It's, are you showing up? Are you being consistent? 
Are yeah. you helping people around you? Are you trying to teach? Are you intentionally putting yourself in these, you know, uncomfortable positions kind of a thing? Mm-hmm. Are you looking to roll with these, you know, these, these belts that are higher than you? Mm-hmm. And it always made me laugh, man. And I didn't get it until I started doing jujitsu, but I'd always see the memes of like, you know, the, how the white belts warm up, you know, and they're, they're doing everything. And then yeah. it's like how the black belts and the brown belts blew up and they're, you know, they, they warm up, they're sitting in the corner, you know, and yeah, like, just, it's like, true they're, though. They're, and yeah. like, because it's not, you know, it's not all about ability, but they've, they've shown up, they've been willing to put themselves in, in uncomfortable positions, you know, and, and continue to do so. And, you know, when you look at blue collar trades, like same thing, man, like it, it's not fun. It's not always fun. It's not always like you're saying comfortable. I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of us get up before the sun is, is up. Let's come home before the, you know, after the, after sun the sun's gone down yeah. and we don't have a, an eight to five shit, dude, Mike there's a raging joke between me and my wife that she's always had a cush job because I mean, and ever since COVID and everything, she's, she works home from home permanently. And like, I've always been that guy. I'm always up way before them. I'm always coming home late, you know, and I'm just like, get busted in my butt. But like at the end of the day, there's a lot of situations that I've been put in my life too, that I just know I wouldn't have been able to handle socially, physically, mentally, anything like that without those types of stresses. And, you know, controversially at the same time, like I have infinitely more human interaction than my wife does. And she'll tell me now all the time. She's like, dude, I need to go out and spend time with somebody other than a freaking toddler. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, I just want to come home and not see anyone at all. <laughs> Cause that's oh, all I, I do. Know. That's and, the same and thing with me and my it's wife. It's just like... weird. Right. And, it, but same time I start talking to her about these situations and she's like, I don't, I don't know how you reacted that way. And I'm like, that's normal. Yeah. You know? And she's like, well, so it's just interesting. It's it's weird to see that, and and it's weird to see the two different like parallels to each other. And I, I don't know. I think that it's kind of the same concept as the phone thing. You know, we're all so used to texting each other, messaging each other, doing those types of things that we almost don't know how to interact in person. Yeah. yeah. And I, we were talking about the podcast stuff at the beginning yeah. of this. How easy it is to, how easy it really is, and how simple I should say simple it is to start a podcast. You don't need a ton of money. And you really can pull it off. Wildly uncomfortable it is. But so many people are like, dude, what? Like, yeah. So that's just yeah. normal. Just yeah. Hanging out. That's that's been my the theme of of my life the last probably year. Yeah. Just doing things that yeah, uncomfortable. I've I've always um, you know, work worked doing concrete. I've always I used to do concrete, go to school, um, work out still. Um which I would always get people being like, well, that's, how are you doing? That? That's too hard. You're going to hurt yourself. And it's like, what, what do you yeah. mean? Like, I, I'm fine. I'm over here, you know? Right. It, we're, we're, we can handle a lot more than you think. Um, But now, especially I, I've always, I've been doing things that like jujitsu put me in situations that are super uncomfortable, stressful, mm-hmm. allow me to handle things that happen better. Um, ice baths, cold showers. It's such a fad right now, but you know, such a, such a crazy good thing to do that can help you in the moment when stress has happened that, that can help you handle them and even learning Spanish. Yeah. Uh, I've been learning Spanish the last, you know, I've been doing every day for, I think I have like a 280 day streak or whatever on Duolingo, but which most people don't realize is actually like, <laughs> difficult to do to remember oh, to get on hard. that thing and study. Oh, it's hard. And and I don't always do it before I go to work and then I get busy and then I get to the end of the day and I'm sure my wife gets upset because I'm doing it and she's trying to talk to me and yeah. stuff. And I'm like, I just need to do at least one to right. get get it done. But that's super uncomfortable learning that going out of my way to talk to people in Spanish. Yeah. yeah. Super hard. Oh yeah. And you're your whole life you're told, you know, we, we talked about this like a little bit before about how everybody's their mindset around the trades is everybody in America is like of the opinion that you can't learn a language after you're like a child. Yeah. <laughs> it's like impossible. <laughs> evidently. I yeah. mean, and, and so few people here speak another language. Right. So hard, I guess. And, and it's like, it is, it takes a lot of time. And it's uncomfortable. Sure. And I, and that leads back to, well, it's just uncomfortable and people don't want to be uncomfortable. You have to go out of your way to be uncomfortable in, in America yeah. legitimately. Yeah, so do. have you ever seen a uh, proportionate, correct map of the world? 
Um, Look it up. I don't think so. Weird. Proportionate correct. Okay, so like <laughs> proportionately correct map of the world. It, it is so odd. Yeah. Specifically when you're talking about languages, right? Most yeah. people in the United States don't speak two languages. Like that's the thing. Well, what yeah. about Europe? Oh, you know, how many people speak two, three, four languages? I heard in that in Europe you have to be able to speak two and learn a third. It's the norm when when you're in school. Yeah. Going it's to the school. norm, dude. But when you look at a an actual proportionately accurate map of the, of the planet, you can almost shove like you can shove the entirety of Europe into the United States with room to spare, right? Pretty pretty easily. Wow, actually, I mean, you look. You, you could just take Utah for example, since that's where we're at. You could take Utah and you compare that to most European countries yeah. and Utah's way bigger than most wow. of them. So you get, you get thinking, okay, I can drive three, five, seven hours and hit two, three, potentially four countries yeah. that all speak different languages yeah. for them. It's, it's a part of their life often, right? Maybe yes. not every single time, but it is often a part of their, of their life. They're running into older. people that speak differently. We have to go out of our way. Like you're saying to yes. find those interactions to be yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah. So there's no reason for us to do it. Yeah, there isn't. And really, like, there isn't a whole lot of. I mean, I can't say benefit. There's there's really not a whole lot of reason. Yeah. That we'll just go with that. Depending there, on who you there's are. There's not a whole lot right. of reason yeah. to speak the another language or learn one. It is very helpful, very beneficial. Absolutely. Um, can definitely make you more money. Absolutely. Um, if I mean, for for example, even in construction, we'll just we'll just keep the construction example. If you can speak Spanish and you can manage, you know, Mexican workers and you can do the culture thing. I mean, imagine the possibilities there because there's especially not a here whole in the Western. United oh, especially States. here. There's so many people here that speak Spanish. Absolutely. And only Spanish. Yeah. And or or very, very limited English to the point that it's really like not reasonable to work with them right if you can do that and you can manage them you can make a lot of money and, and be pretty much handed a job if, if you even if you have like you know experience but not that good of experience but you can yeah. speak the language yeah i mean it, because you have to go so much out of your way just nobody does yep and everybody just you know thinks that oh english is like you know the world the language of the world we don't need to learn it like we're we're too good. We're too yeah. good to learn another language. And it's like it's this weird thing where it's always we're too good to do the work, the hard work, the right. doing something else Absolutely. outside of it. I mean, you even go look at you know, working out. I mean, I saw a meme just just today. I was sharing about it. And like somehow the this news, I don't even remember what it was, this media outlet was saying that the the far right's obsession with working out I is going that. digital and i was like i'm reading that headline i'm like a weird way to yeah. think about that as if only people on the far right political spectrum as, as if, if the, politics has anything as to do if with politics health. yeah as if only those people like to work out and take care of themselves and as sure. if that's a far right thing to do is to want to be taking care of yourself yeah. and i mean there's so many polarizing views here that people just like want to just stick in the norm and not do anything different, stand out. And, and the norm isn't really good. Yeah. You know, and, and that, that goes with, and that goes, that can literally be applied to everything that can be applied to people going to school. That can be applied to, um, you know, just going to school just because everybody else does. That can be applied to everything. Oh, absolutely. Not, you know, not learning a language. It's just a, it's just weird. Um, customs and norms that we have, and and I am very grateful to be in America. But it's like a lot, a lot of the things I see him just like, wow. I mean, the amount of people I see that are just unhealthy, terribly unhealthy, are complaining about stuff that doesn't matter, uh, just because. And it's like, they're just a joke. Well, I think it's Andy Frisella. I'm pretty sure it's Andy Frisella. Yeah, my boy. I'm pretty sure it was him that said this, but when you're talking about, I don't know, you can call it success, you can call it overachievement, whatever you want to call it. If you are willing to go out of your way, even by 1% to do this stuff that's going to make you uncomfortable and go 1% further than anybody else, learning a language, dude, 
just like I was telling you earlier, man, like I'll speak to any native Spanish speaker there is. And I will not feel bad if I make a mistake, if I screw up anything. Why? Because I know full well, two things. Number one, I know I speak a second language period. End of story. Right. I can communicate. Number two, I know plenty of people that have learned English as their second language yes. and I know how it feels. Yes. However, I will also never give those people grief or make fun of them or anything like that. If they make a mistake, why? Because they still speak one more English, one more language than how many yeah. people, especially in the United States. Yeah. Right. So is it absolutely imperative for me to, to know Spanish in my life? No, no, not really. It's, it's definitely not, you know, yeah. for me, has it wildly benefited me yeah. Yeah, yeah. 100% yeah. even, and this is just a weird happenstance subject, but even when we live in Utah, I, I dare argue that there's a lot more like white people, white young adults, I don't know, white people in Utah who speak multiple languages yeah. specifically because of the, you yeah. know, the LDS church and yes. missionaries yeah. and that type yeah. of stuff. Oh, I, have, I would argue you know, that that have. has a very larger concentration than oh, anywhere yeah. else as far as actual, just like white Americans are concerned. But like, I, I just know full well, like, dude, uh, there's even here still so many people that don't speak yeah. it, you know? And, and we were having that conversation that, you pick up any of it at all. Mm. Okay, great. Now between English and Spanish, you can communicate with roughly 60% of the people on the planet, mm. potentially, maybe even 70, depending on where you're at. So is it really like that beneficial in your day-to-day -day life? Maybe not right now. Yeah. Is the potential upside of mm. that yeah. literally unfathomable? Yeah. For sure. Well, that's right? a little bit too you know, outgoing thinking for a lot of people. I mean, <laughs> it is, but it, it's such a simple thought yeah. though, but it, it almost seems yeah. common sense, right? Because yeah. you mentioned it earlier, English is like the national business language, Yeah, whatever. Start thinking about Spanish. Nobody really thinks Spanish is such a, I shouldn't say nobody. I love it. There's a lot of people who think that Spanish isn't such like a cool, rad yeah. language. You know, when yeah. I wanted to learn my first language, I wanted it to be like Russian or something, right? Yeah. Really wouldn't have benefited me nearly as much, but yeah. like, then I start thinking, oh, yeah, legitimately, the entire West, I can communicate with the entire Western part of the planet. Mm -hmm. And then I start thinking Spain, you know, Australia, England, any of these other countries that, you know, they probably also know English in mm -hmm. you know, these European countries. Yeah, I can probably go 70% of the planet anywhere like that and go yeah. communicate with some folks yeah. with those two languages only. Yeah. So something like that and just knowing that and then also having the respect for those people you know especially in our trades and in our industry where we've got people that are willing to put in this work yes. and they're coming to learn and oftentimes you know like we were talking about don't have the luxury of spending so much time and in some cases money to prioritize speaking english because they're mm -hmm. trying to provide they're trying to to yeah. earn the fact that they're willing to try and the fact that they're that they're doing it man I will never give anybody grief for that crap mm. because, hey, man, you're speaking two freaking languages, yeah. which I've been there. I know what it's like, dude. And English is infinitely harder than Spanish mm. for right. sure. Yeah. So that's a that's a fun, amazingly cool thing to think about when you think about, again, these people that might not be considered so smart, mm. who might be considered, you know, well, shit, we're all... um essential workers now, yeah. right? But yeah. these essential worker guys, like, dude, no, probably some of the smarter, smarter people that, you know, they yeah. just can't communicate. Didn't they just, well, that, with or they just the didn't want to go do yeah. some of that dumb yeah. stuff. You well, know, yeah. they, they enjoy working with their hands. They enjoy providing oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. these value for people. And like, nah, I'd argue that they're probably as intelligent as, yeah. as anybody else oh, yeah. walking around well, with a doctorate's degree. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, the somehow worth is tied to a, a piece of paper. 100%. It says that you know, you know, you know certain things, even though some employers don't even take certain pieces of paper from certain establishments. Exactly, it's, it's weird. If that was the but, be all end all, then why would why would people with oh, doctorates degrees and stuff like go out of their way to learn other languages and to continue to seek oh, education? Yeah. If that was the yeah. be all end all, because because it's about the education, it's about furthering you know yourself, furthering yourself, putting yourself in tough situations, and continually yep. being willing to do it. Yep, challenging yourself. Oh, hundred percent. Well, on Rad, that dude. note, on challenging yourself, I have one kind of final question. Okay, what's coming up for you? And yeah, you know, we talked about this a little bit. You know, oh yeah, talk about this to close out. Do we? Well, number one, what's I'm stoked. Up? Um, 
because we're going to have you there <laughs> finally. Yeah. Um, so anybody who's listening to this, um, there is going to be an opportunity here on August 25th to come and listen to Jaden speak on stage live and in person. Um, he's going to be one of our, yeah. our experts. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be rad. Um, on August 25th, like I said, we're going to be hosting our third, uh, we call them arena nights. Um, it's literally based on the concept of the man in the arena. He's, you know, he's got all eyes on him and he's the one that's doing it. Um, the theme for this arena night is, it's called Write Your Own Story. It is a, a leadership focused um, event. It is a free event that we put on. Um, feel free to bring anybody that you'd like. Um, I'll make sure that we get the links over to you and everything, um, for Eventbrite and stuff like that. But we host those out here in Sandy, Utah. Um, it's a couple hours. There's going to be some networking, things like that for people to come and and touch base. Um, and then at the end of the year here on uh, December 16th, we're also going to have our first ever, uh, charity auction gala. Um, it's going to be a live speaking event as well, but we are going to have a dinner and that's going to be benefiting, um, Operation Underground Railroad. So we're going to be donating all proceeds, you know, from that gala to them. So uh, if you guys have an opportunity to to come out and help support them, and that would be rad. And and like I said, come support, uh, you know, come support myself, come support Jaden and anybody else that's going to be speaking. We've got a couple really great people, um, you know, and potentially pick up a, a coach or somebody that might help you advance too while you're there. So yeah. stoked for that. That'll be blast. Yeah. Well, I know I've been, I've missed out on the last couple and and wanted to speak at one of them yeah and you know it, it get in my head about speaking at an event and an event because i'm like man who am i to sure who am i to do that but, that's the whole point of these things exactly yeah. literally i mean and i yep. and you're not the first i'll tell you too you're you're not the first person <laughs> that their first one was them actually speaking so yeah um yeah i mean that that's the point is making literally kind of going out of my way to make people that I would consider my friends uncomfortable so that they can advance, you know? Awesome. And it's so rad. It's yeah. so fun to see everybody do it. Cause yeah. you're going to be just like everyone else, man. As yeah. soon as you get up there and catch your flow, it's going to be like, yeah, this is the last. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah. You're going to do great. It's going to be yeah, awesome. So. Well, man, it's been an awesome conversation. Um, um, thanks for having me. And you know, people can go to find you at, I am Jake Danzy. Yep. I am Jake Danzy on Instagram and then uh, Axiom Alliance uh, coaching is uh, where we post all the information for the events. So I'll kind of double them up. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on, man. Thanks, Shane. I hope everybody else liked this conversation. Yeah, appreciate it. Like I did.